Right now at 6, racist threats target students at an Oregon college campus. New reaction and the effort to pinpoint who's behind them. Then, six people rescued after a sudden windstorm on the Columbia capsizes a fishing boat with one boater still missing. So we got the 35, 40 mile an hour knot wind that came up instantly. Plus, how rising costs are putting the squeeze on a local shelter that cares for animals in need. And the root of the problem is on city property. I don't understand why the city wouldn't step up and just take care of a problem. Why a homeowner is being told to get rid of this tree and foot the bill. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Molko. And I'm Christine Pitawanich. Tonight, Pacific University is responding to hate speech and violent threats made toward black students there this week. Let's get right to Daisy Caballero, live near the campus in Forest Grove. So, Daisy, what are you learning? Well, David and Christine, no injuries have been reported and police have been notified about this. Now, what we're told is that these threats were made on an anonymous social media app called Yik Yak, which is pretty common and pretty popular among college students and campuses. A spokesperson with Pacific University says that the school was made aware of these threats two days ago. They sent an email to, out to their students and staff members last night describing the Yik Yak post directed towards black students union members. The post included racial slurs like the N word and a picture of a noose. According to that email, I spoke with Dr. Pierre Morton. He's the vice president of equity, diversity, inclusion and accessibility at Pacific. He says he couldn't believe something like this is happening in 2024. Our um, campus safety uh, is doing double double duty, um, but I don't think that there's a threat. I, I really believe that hurt people hurt people, uh, and in today's uh, political discourse, it has given permission for people to uh, say things that, that they would not normally say to a person face to face. I also spoke with two freshman Pacific University students. One says she was surprised when she read that email and decided to log into Yik Yak and saw the post herself. A little worried for the community. A little scared for everyone at the because I thought it was a pretty welcoming community and I saw like the club and the back student union and I almost joined. I was debating on joining and then I saw all of that and then I was just like, oh no. The university says it's meeting directly with students and providing resources through the Office of Student Support, the Counseling Center, and the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. Now, the university says that it is working on gathering IP addresses behind this post to be able to share that information with the Forest Grove Police Department. David and Christine, back to you guys. Absolutely no excuse for hate like that. Thank you, Daisy. In your headlines, Portland police are searching for the person who shot and injured someone this afternoon in the Argate Terrace neighborhood. This is around 345 on Northeast 133rd place in the parking lot of the Friendly Village Market. The person who was shot was taken to the hospital. No word on the suspect. And we are learning more about what prompted an hours long order to stay inside last night in Vancouver. The Clark County Sheriff's Office says a man with a gun approached a deputy who was waiting to enter the Clark County Jail in a patrol car. He started yelling and appeared to be suicidal. Then the man rode away on an e-bike, but hours later, authorities say they found him along the Burnt Bridge Creek Trail near a neighborhood. He was taken to the hospital, then jail. That gun turned out to be a pellet gun. A quick reminder, anyone needing help can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline 24-7 at 988. And five people are in jail after the sheriff's office busted what it's calling a multi-state stolen muscle car ring. Detectives say the group targeted local dealerships and then hired scouts to find people who owned certain types of scar cars and then stole them. A raid in Vancouver turned up 11 cars worth more than $700,000 stolen from as far away as the Bay Area and Bellingham. Authorities also seized nine guns and some $40,000 in cash. 
Now let's take a live look from Tampa Bay, Florida. A little gray out there as well. You can't really see much, but that area not directly in the path of Hurricane Helene. Still, though, getting a lot of rain and located more than 100 miles to the south. You can see if you squint a little bit, maybe a little bit of the storm surge coming up over one of the major roadways. Farther up the coast, though, people are bracing for landfall in the coming hours. Today, Helene rapidly intensified from a Category 1 to a Category 4 hurricane. All right, Chief Meteorologist Matt Sfino tracking this extremely dangerous storm for us, Matt. Yeah, thanks, David. That was an interesting sky cam to show you because you could see that storm surge and Tampa isn't even close to the center of the storm. Tampa, of course, down here. Here's the center of Helene now bearing down on the big bend of Flo uh, Florida here. Now where you see the blue, that's the eye wall. That's where the winds will be that 130 mile an hour range. That's where the rain will be the most intense. It's already spun up tornadoes even earlier in the day today is well offshore, but it is uh, very close to landfall right now and it is accelerating to the north northeast at about 23 miles an hour. It is a very strong storm, obviously category four, also a very big storm. Diameter is about 500 miles, so consider from the Canadian border to the Oregon California border roughly. That's how big of an area this storm is covering and the water will be a thing. The winds get the attention. The water as always does the most damage. The storm surge in here will be upwards of 20 feet it's being categorized as catastrophic and unsurvivable. So again, Tampa, where we showed you that that sky cam well away from the center. It's up here where that storm surge is going to be the strongest. Now the winds have been upgraded again now at 140 miles an hour, so it continues to undergo what we call rapid intensification. You mentioned it went from a one early in the day to a strong category four. Now the gusts 150 55 miles an hour, just incredible, and the pressure continues to drop. The path is going to take it right up the gut of Georgia, where it will drop copious amounts of rain, upwards of 20 inches, high winds as far north as the Appalachians of North Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky, five inches rain at least in Atlanta. Parts of that region will see 20 inches of rain, and it's going to stall out. The remains will stall out and continue to produce incredible rain across the southeast. These are the wind warnings, as you can see, hundreds of miles inland from the coast. This is a big deal and a very, very bad day across the southeast, guys. Yeah, really appreciate you keeping us updated, though, Matt. Thank you. Back in our area today, search crews were out looking for a missing boater on the Columbia River after a boat capsized near White Salmon yesterday with seven people on board. Tim Gordon's in the newsroom. Tim, as we came on the air here at six, we just got an update from search crews. What are you hearing? Yeah, that's right, David. The Hood River County Sheriff's Office says they found the capsized boat today but have not found the missing boater. They have identified him as Michael Shuffelt from Woodland, Washington. He's now presumed dead, but recovery efforts continue. News of the situation spread quickly and a number of local boaters joined the search yesterday and again early this morning. The boat capsized before noon yesterday near the mouth of the White Salmon River on the Washington side of the Columbia River. Six people were pulled ashore, two were taken to the hospital. Another guide who was on the water Wednesday morning told KGW that conditions were initially calm, but when he returned to shore around midday, winds quickly picked up. He says he saw the other boat shortly before it capsized and waved to the other guide. Later, when he learned what had happened, he joined that search effort. Here's what he had to say today about that missing guide. Uh, outgoing, funny guy, man, real fishy guy, knows he's in this area really well. Um, I fish with him down in the woodland area. Uh, Bowie 10, real good guy, man. So efforts will continue to recover both the boat and Sheffield's body, but the search mission is now over. David Christine. Yeah, not the news anyone was hoping for this evening. Thank you, Tim. Well, a tree, a property line and $5,000. That's what's at the root, so to speak, of a fight between a Southwest Portland homeowner and the city. Here's Blair Best with the story. This all started eight months ago when Jeremy Peters got a letter from the city of Portland. It said he was responsible for removing this tree. It's on city property and more than 30 feet away from his southwest Portland home. So I was like, I, how are we even responsible for that? The tree's roots had started to damage the sidewalk. And under current city code, that means it's the responsibility of the closest property owner to remove it. The city says that's Jeremy, and it would cost him about $5,000. Again, that's a huge amount of money. 
money. I don't see how we're responsible and I don't understand why the city wouldn't step up and just take care of a problem. Over the next several months, Jeremy spent 3000 removing the damaged sidewalk along with numerous inspections before calling for help. At that point, we said forget it and we called the ombudsman to to see what we could figure out because it's getting ridiculous. The ombudsman's office recently released a report calling on the city to foot the bill. Here's the city's deputy ombudsman. I find it very concerning that the city has not jumped to take this responsibility. Meanwhile, the report shows that the city of Portland paid to remove a tree here outside the Portland Art Museum. It was mainly on private property, except for six inches that grew onto the public right of way, raising concerns over the fairness of these city codes. A spokesperson for Portland Parks and Recreation says the tree outside the art museum was considered a heritage tree, which the city is responsible for, different from the one in Southwest. Our office really considers this fundamentally unfair, these two different situations. Like, come on, like, I can't get any help or you can't just do what you need to do, city. I think it's people's expectations on what they can expect with the city. They want, um, the rules to be written clearly so that they have an understanding of what they're responsible for. All right, so the city admits that their rules around trees and who's responsible for them are confusing and complex, and they're trying to make changes to city code to limit the impacts on property owners, and it's a move that we're told tonight that the mayor supports. Back to you. Blair Best outside City Hall this evening. Thank you, Blair.